Tiffany, over to you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Libby. Um, great to see so many people here today. Um, and thank you, John, so much for that talk. So much stuff I didn't know. I'm not going to be talking much about feeding at all. It's not my expertise. Um, as mentioned, I'm a senior ecologist with the Biodiversity Conservation Trust. We work with landholders to protect important habitat on private property. But I'm not here in that capacity today. I'm just here as a volunteer because I uh, really like to be part of uh, your efforts to, to help support wildlife during these really awful conditions. So I have been in the valley, I think, for about six months. And when I drove down this morning, I was a little bit shocked to see the amount of canopy dieback, not from scorching, not from no. fires. Yeah. This is from Fred. drying. Yeah, this yeah. is from lack of water in the landscape. Yeah. And um, I think we've got to stop banding this word drought about. This is this is climate change we're seeing. And this isn't my opinion. Okay, climate change is not an opinion or a belief. This is physical observations, scientific observations of the physical environment around us. Okay, and we've just we've just got to accept that. And we've made huge changes to these landscapes. In the valley, we see that the valley floor is um, heavily cleared. It's really productive land. And that was really productive for biodiversity in the past as well. You know, this is why it's been such a key... Good morning. A, uh, a key hot spot for uh, well, the region of honey that Ross is going to talk about in a minute. Because these really productive lands um, grew large trees that produced large volumes of nectar, fantastic food for things like honey eaters, as well as a suite of other animals too, and lots of ar arboreal um, sorry, arboreal mammals as well. Uh, yeah, so so what I'm going to concentrate on is is actually providing water to the animals and how we can do that effectively, cheaply, and I know one of the speakers later is actually going to give us a bit of a demo of uh, putting together some of these little water fountains that were popping up all over the interwebs at the moment. Um, so, Julie, if you can press the button for me. So, there are uh, many different styles out there. Uh, we've got this phenomenally complex looking thing here, which is supposed to be a koala water. It has water on the ground with one of these uh, ball valve or float valve little troughs, and a slightly bigger trough up here. As John was saying, things like koalas, they're primarily arboreal. They don't like coming down to the ground for water, and it's much safer for them to drink at the height. There's this really interesting looking contraption, um, which uh, I think is a chook, a chook water, up. yes. <laughs> Somebody's shoved a chook water up a tree, well, you know, that's fine. You've uh, obviously got to go back and refill it quite often. Uh, I don't know if you, any of you have heard about the, the, the blinky drinkers. That's what the left hand one is supposed to be. That, that's, that's the style that um, Port Macquarie Koala Hospital is, is building in okay. the hundreds. Okay, yeah. all right. There's a, there's a slightly more simple blinky drinker which uses the, the little little float bell trough at height, well I say simple, they actually have a water which is pumped up to this, so it's so it's sitting up in a tree, you know, five metres above the ground, and a whole range of animals come in to use this, not just the koalas, because obviously it's much safer taking water further off the ground, you're, you're away from those uh, feral predators, cats and foxes, which um, being very cunning animals, so uh, we'll probably see more of, of the edges of the fire grounds now, they tend to come in and uh, pick off animals that are, are coming out of these burnt areas looking for food. Uh, so this, this middle one, this was I think designed by a group in South Australia called Arid Recovery. It's pretty straightforward, poly pipe, a uh, little hole cut in the bottom and a, a, a little uh, a curled bit of PVC at, uh, at the base there. And that holds something like 40 litres and, and out in the arid areas of South Australia lasts for about two weeks. And you can see on the table, I assume you're going to be making something similar, but a lot more simple. Uh, you've just got two elbows at the bottom of a long bit of PVC pipe, and you can strap that to a stake um, and leave that for uh, a couple of weeks. And uh, animals, lots of different animals will come in to uh, use it. So the issue there, of course, is that um, the water is quite close to the ground. So again, you've got a problem with the, with the predators. So you might want to think about ways of, of raising that that pipe so, it's, so that... Anything coming in to feed is not quite as vulnerable. 
with that one they're saying you have to worry about it going stagnant as well after one week if it's not placed in correct shaded areas. Okay, that's a great point. Yeah. yeah. The yeah, same so with don't. the quieter ones. I've been doing yeah. that with Dr. Kelly Lee. They have to be super shaded or it will go stagnant and it's bad for Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. Okay, so choose choose your point, choose your spot wisely. So uh, you're reducing likelihood of uh, animals getting picked off by predators, and uh, it's nice and shaded, so um, we avoid that stagnation issue, which seems to have happened in that tub there. I must say, but um, the I suppose the good thing about this tub is the quantity of water, and also it shows uh, with that sort of chicken mesh at the side and in the tub itself a way of avoiding any mortality, so birds, for instance, that might come in. If, if the water's too deep, there's a chance they're going to drown. Uh, you don't want that because, obviously, it's the loss of that, the life of that bird, but it's also going to contaminate the water too. And this final one, again, we've got the, the little float bell trough. You can pick those up for, I think, about around $30 or something. Maybe cheaper if you go for a, you know, a whole lot of you gang together and, and, and buy a large number of them. You can probably get them quite cheaply. And really useful because you can stick, as we see, that large tub there for the water. It means that um, the, uh, the, the trough is continually full and you're not having to go back and, and replenish that every, every day or every couple of days. With these ones as well, if we're finding you need to strap them to the trees rather than put them on a trough or the wombats come along and just push mm. them out and it collapses. And, okay. yeah. So we decided not to use the base there. You, you, we put them between the wedges of the trees and get thin lines. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so that's Sorry. No, that's There's great. That's really what about the kittens, though? You still need something on the ground, don't you? For them? I don't know. Yes. The trough's yeah. on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. see, with the, so the tub oh, sitting on another tub. So, yeah. as the, so as the water enters, the trough gets lighter. Yeah. It's easier. To move. So the trough's there for them. Yeah. 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 We've been setting up those little ones in down the south coast, the PVC ones. Um, especially for reptiles okay. um, yeah. and what we've been doing is putting a whole lot of rocks around the base yeah. mm -hmm. and the other thing you can do is hang a little bit of hessian in mm -hmm. so insects mm -hmm. like bees and things like that can, can, get can drink so yeah. Yeah. you know yeah, yeah we're trying to get them up in trees but there's also a whole lot of little critters that mm -hmm. have survived on the edge and the, mm -hmm. the fires there were massive they were very hot so there's, mm -hmm. there's not, not much, much left, left. Yeah. there's not much left the other thing about these tube ones is well, we're finding you need to put like a, a mesh in them so animals can crawl back out. Because depending yeah. on the yeah. small or big funnels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah I did actually see that this morning. So we had sort of tacked on yeah, a bit of mesh that leads into the top of the yeah. yeah. Okay. That's great. You can put rocks in it too. You can you actually put, any you, if you use the 150, um, the 150 is the biggest one that you can get, then you can, you can put a few rocks in there too. So that, that helps. Does that impact the suction part? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Just, yeah, sure, we're just going to be around the thing. He's designed. <laughs> oh, excellent. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you get those little trophy things from? Well, these ones? Um, yeah. I, well, uh, they're selling them at stock food places. They're dog, dog yes, self yeah, water yeah, bottles. Right, yeah. You just get them as the dog ones. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is it important for yeah. birds to have a bird bath as well? Or is that not important? It's more just. Uh, it is because that helps keep the feathers um, yeah. intact and mm. clean. Um, but I think. They start taking craps and that won't be a bit of Yeah, that, that's right. So, so that's the issue. So, so primarily, we are talking about watering. If you, if you can spare the water, I've got actually the next slide. Okay, now the next, next slide doesn't. Um, yeah, okay, so in, in my backyard, I've got a few bird baths. So I've got one that's quite quite high, sitting in the stump of an old a dead tree, a uh, peach tree, and the hardworks, the smaller birds absolutely love it. Um, and they use it to drink and they use it to bathe. It's one on the ground, I don't have any cats. Um, and a sort of traditional stone one too, with a nice shallow, shallow incline. So that's really the key. You don't want anything with a terribly steep lip, because the smaller birds don't like it, they're a bit cautious about using it. But a nice shallow uh, slope is really good for a bath and for drinking. The purpose of the tweets? Um, well, it's partially to give them uh, a perching point, so you can get a lot more birds coming in with the tweets. It's it's a little bit of shelter, so they don't feel so exposed to predators. Um, and of course, it makes it really difficult to take a photograph. 
You didn't get, you've got your red browns but no fire tails. <laughs> no, I don't they get diamond fire tails in town and that. Well, actually once, I've been in 20 years, but no, I haven't got a fire tails. Uh, I have a little bush block I come over with my sister near Hilland and um, we have this this water hole in the rock which I think must have been made by Wiradjuri in you know, wow. centuries past and it's only this summer it's dried out and we found you know, a rather desperate echidna in there. So it holds about 25 litres and uh, we've been filling it up while we're not there. But um, you can see you know, it's dry and these animals are coming in and they are desperate for water. So this is sort of swimming around a shallow place in the cat. So um, yeah, so having water on the ground is important for reptiles, echidnas, wombats, but also having water uh, higher up, so uh, smaller birds are protected from predation. It's really important. And is it the same as feeding stations? Should we be moving them around so they're not in the same thing, so the same space, so the predators? Don't get used to them. I think or? probably with these water fountains, these uh, the supplementary ones. Um, I would say if you've got a raised watering system, it's it's probably not too bad. Uh, I've never seen. I mean, I'm in a suburban garden, but I've never seen predation at my water baths. But maybe I should ask Vicky, who's mm. I know has had bird baths. Should be fine. Mm. Should be fine. Okay, so you don't get. Predatory birds coming in and picking things off at your bird bar. No. And if, if they're sheltered, like when you um, think about where you placement, again, because we do talked about stagnating water. So a sheltered spot, lots of cover, so the birds can come down and check out who's around before dropping down to the water. So anything, you know, if you've got overhanging boughs, that's perfect. Put a raised um, bird bar on it. Just with the food stations, we're finding in places like in the Megalong and the Canimba that we are finding that the carnivals are coming in. We're finding carnival scat around the base of where they so I'm telling them to move them. Water stations, obviously, it's really hard, particularly the big ones. Mm -hmm. The arboreal ones, probably okay, depending on what species we're dealing with. But yeah. I think one of the important things is look out for a fauna scat. Carnival scat is very, very different to. Mm. All your veg veggies and omnivores. Mm. Yeah. Look, look for your dog scat, your cat scat, your whole scat. And it also depends on what areas you're in. Like if you're in the Blue Mountains, by all means, you need to start looking out for that stuff. And it's it's happening already. We only put stations out a week ago. Mm. So now we're putting up cameras to see what's coming in. I've told them to move them to other safe areas. Yeah. Okay. So we do need to be aware of that. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Uh, no, hang on. I haven't talked about this one yet. Um, well, in fact, John talked so well in, in such depth about this. Um, I don't think I should really say anything. But I occasionally put the seed out and parrots come in and I was, went to the pet store and got some native seed mix and it's composed of totally non-native seeds, I would say. It's all <laughs> native bird mix, but it's mostly sorghum and, um, and there is some sunflower in it, so uh, yeah, it's all the same. But to avoid that because of the, the level of fat in it. In supermarkets you'll sometimes see these sort of uh, cakes of seed and I think that's something really to avoid because thing that will be holding them together, uh, it could be molasses, but it's, it might, might be fat as well, and you, and you don't want to increase the fat in the bird's diet. I, uh, I've got a, a row of whole apple trees in the backyard, and they uh, haven't had many apples this year, but we do get fruit bats coming in, so I've been supplementary putting, finding uh, sort of old fruit down at the IGA and shoving it up in the apple tree for the bats, but I've also got Caramel was coming in to feed them, but um, because it was too dark to take a photo of the fruit bat. This is the caramel. Okay, so just pretend it's dark and that's the fruit bat. That's the fruit bat under the Sorry, just with the seeds, can we be careful because of weeds and things like that? Taking the seeds out of the fruit. Uh, no, seeds are the fruit, but the bird seed. The bird seed, yeah. That can spread a lot yeah. of weeds into the national parks and the edge of the bushlands. So yeah. depending on where you're doing it, you've got to be careful. Yeah. I, I think mm. it, with that in the context, there is kind of two things that we're talking about. There's the supplementing animals on your property where you can have a really close eye on things and manage that sort of stuff, like what Tiff's doing at her place. You know when there's stuff coming up you know when there's problems starting to arise versus 
we're going out to people's places that might not be around, we're putting out stuff and then leaving it and that's where the risks yeah. are more than you're doing a little bit extra to the birds that have come out of the mm. bush that's burned and are now dependent on your help, yeah, on your place. Right. Yeah. I mean, I suppose in, in that case, you know, you, you could take precautions, like you could put a tarp down. That, that's what um, I mean, just, yeah, yeah. things like that. And your, your raised source of above yeah. it, yeah. And people are using things like hubcaps so that they have draining holes and you can just hammer it onto the side of a tree, put a little bit of seed in it. Um, and the thing to remember when you when you are feeding, if you uh, that you really need to clean those uh, feeding utensils, utensils, whatever your hubcaps or your trays uh, regularly, often to avoid. Uh, um, John talked about uh, cytokosis and other uh, you know, diseases that might spread through um, the birds or animals. And you can do it's pretty simple. Just get a bit of round vinegar, you know, scrub it round the plate, whatever it is you're using. Um, that's uh, used pretty tried and tested. I don't know. I assume that would be all right. Um, unfortunately, John's outside, so who <laughs> <laughs> might might see if he has any uh, opinion on this? I'm just talking you, about. Um, if you, you didn't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that, John. I was just saying if we if we put out seed on a tray, then uh, regular cleaning of that tray should reduce um, the incidence of disease spread. And you can use something like vinegar, is that what you'd recommend? Yeah, it? either that or a very diluted bleach, but make sure you then rinse it off properly and yeah. then leave it in the sun for a while yeah. and dilute the kill the bleach off as well. Sunlight itself is very yes. good. Yes, yeah, yeah, good point. Uh, sanitized yeah. as well. Okay. But, um, yeah, it needs, and, and also turn the seed out of regularly, especially if it gets wet. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what can you feed birds though? I'm a bit confused. Feed birds. Well, yeah. it depends on the species. Depends on the species. Yeah. So about, so, well, there's about ten different. And I'm, you're, you're the lady that knows all about birds. <laughs> there's about ten different sort of species within frugivores, omnivores, fiscivores, granivores, or carnivores, the whole bit, you know. Uh, depends. So, where do we find this information then? What's the best place to look to get well, specific information? Um, I'm not too sure whether Wires has it on their site. I yeah, know the try, try, the, try the Wires website. Yes. Mm. There, I think there are some information There's sheets There's also there a couple of um, <laughs> flyers out there that BirdLife have put out on mm. how to support birds, and one of them has got a bit of a um, lay down on what sort of different things. So no sugar water, but you can maybe yeah, if no you no want to do honey. No, 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 no. Um, so but, but stuff like that. Having said that, we're talking about the adult ones here. If you've got orphan birds for that, you shouldn't. It's illegal for you to try and raise them because they are an Australian native animal. They belong to the Crown. Like Bessie doesn't put much money in, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's illegal for you to foster care a native animal or rehab it unless you're a trained, licensed keeper to these people down there. Uh, and uh, with, so, so you, I get people that bring up and say, oh, I've got a little thing and I've been trying to feed it this, I've been trying to feed it that. They feed kangaroo, cow's milk, hey, whoa, lactose intolerant. <laughs> but don't try and raise these little birds when they fall out of nests and things. They've got to go to proper carers. Because when it's small and you can't tell what sort it is, it's what it eats. So we all have our own little secret brews that we make up that can feed any of those types of feeders to get them point where we can identify them and that. But we're talking more about sustaining big birds here, please. Uh, please bring wire for us if there's a bird on the ground or something and it's injured because it's illegal for you to treat the bird. Uh, I don't know if the park has ever whacked anybody for it, but uh, yeah, something like that, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, so areas where the where you might have lost a lot of canopy and you've lost really important components of that canopy like mistletoe, which at this time of year is flowering, so the box mistletoe is flowering, that's producing a lot of nectar, attracting a lot of insects. If you, uh, if you can get out there and, and shove some slightly off fruit, that's going to provide not only um, sugar, uh, but attract insects too, so all those insectivorous birds. I mean, you're doing a, you're doing a sort of a, a double whammy there. We've lost a lot of habitat, a lot of leaf litter, a lot of fallen timber with the fires. If, if
if you've suffered that on your properties, you might want to think about supplementing habitat for things like particularly reptiles and uh, invertebrates too, um, because they're, of course invertebrates are uh, in, the, in, the, in the food chain, sort of very near the bottom, so they provide energy for a lot of animals further up the chain. So in my backyard I've done something very basic, I've just got a bit of corrugated iron, weighted it down with a rock, and um, I haven't lifted it up for a while, but I believe there are a huge number of critters living under there. Mm. So even something that simple, and if you've got things like, and, and different sorts of habitats, different, uh, like ceramic tiles, or um, For us sleepers. people with heaps of junk everywhere we now, yes. don't have all the junk. Hooray! habitat. Awesome, I've got an excuse now. <laughs> Just don't lift them later, yeah. Yet. <laughs> yeah, so moving these sort of materials out onto the edges, as I said, it'll be burnt areas on your property. Um, it's just it'll just be brilliant because it'll provide providing that extra shelter that's being lost mm. in the fires, mm. and that's really important now as soon as possible to do this sort of stuff. Geckos. Mm. What was that? Geckos. I've got I've got oh, a few okay. of the oh, family awesome. of geckos under there, mm. Mm. and and red belly, um, red belly, um, red back spiders. So I don't know. Do the geckos eat the spiders? They, they, seem to, they, seem they seem to live together. Yeah. 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 Share yeah. meals together. Yeah, they're <laughs> sure. yeah. The South Coast, they're going as far as making runways for animals now. Oh. They've got the mesh. Yeah. Mm. And they've got it for like little arboreal ground dwelling animals. Oh, wow. yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Have you seen it? Great. Yeah. 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 Whatever 50 works. 50, 50 metre highways. Yeah, there's 50 metre highways for little arboreal mammals now. That's <laughs> amazing. The interesting thing about the different materials that you use, you attract slightly different mm -hmm. animals. Um, so you'll get um, different species of snakes and some uh, skinks with your corrugated iron. With your wood, you get geckos. You also might get snails. So if you live in the valley, you might have the Cape Verde Valley corrugated snail, mm -hmm. which I think would have been severely impacted by these fires. Um, and things like tiles, again, some of the smaller lizards and reptiles. What was that? The legless was the legless yeah, yeah. And also frogs love um, timber too. Yeah. Mm. More? More? There is, I think there's more. Yes. Uh, so a little bit further down the track, but not too far down the track. Um, I have to think about maybe sticking up some nest boxes. There's been a lot of work about around thermal capacity and usefulness of nest boxes. Many of them are made from marine ply wood, which mm. tends to get even though it's relatively thick, it tends to get very hot in summer and very cold in winter. And uh, there are uh, arborists around who will actually create artificial hollows within a living tree which has a much greater thermal capacity, so it resists that quick heating and cooling uh, that can be dangerous to animals over the year. But as, a, you know, as an interim step, if you can get, um, if you've got any trees left still standing, um, and that's the trouble with tree, the older trees with hollows in, they tend to uh, cut the fire and it goes through them and that's sort of it. Uh, so if we, can, if we can get a few nest boxes up and happening, and uh, if there's a local men shedding candles, it might be. There's lots happening in the Blue Mountains, they can send them down. Yeah. Okay, terrific, alright. So. The other thing that's really good is if you've got any hollows on the ground, you'd stick the uh, post caps on either end, drill a hole in it and stick it up the tree. They oh, last yeah, really, yeah, really well. Okay. All right. They're great. Well, if there's any timber left on the ground. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, great idea. Yeah. All right, so just a few relatively simple ideas. Um, and I really like everybody to think about it because whatever you can do is going to be of assistance to the animals that are, are in strife at the moment due to this. Uh, the, well, not just yeah. bushfires. Around also. here, like they said, most of our fires were in the national parks. Yeah. So we haven't got a lot. Um, so are we putting them on the edges, recommending on the edges of our properties? Yeah, I so think that, so, because what, um, you know, any animals that have managed to escape on those fires, I don't know how many would have, they will be obviously coming out, escaping to areas that are unburned mm -hmm. and looking for food and water. Mm -hmm. That's important. Is it best to keep them on those edges to encourage them to go live in their natural area though? Because like you said, we don't want to bring them down into yeah, I mean, if they're, if, they're, if, they're, if, they're, if they're forest dwelling, <laughs> forest dwelling animals, um, yes, you, they, they probably won't cross large open areas anyway. So you're better off 
um, trying as to do close these things as we um, can. To, uh, uh, at all within the timberline. Yeah. But the other thing that you need to think about is even if you provide a nest box, if the rest of the habitat doesn't provide the resources for the animals that you'd like to breed to breed, you might just end up creating more spots for starlings. Mm. So just keep that in mind. I think you need to, we need to take a, the bigger picture approach to nest boxes and not sort of put them into burned areas before there's really resources for stuff to mm. keep going. Yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. So, that's, so, that's so we're better off putting them on the edges of yes. our property yeah. where... Where there's unburned area. That, yeah. Yeah. If it's possible, I'd highly recommend 50 metres in. Edge environments are great predator runways. Mm -hmm. I'd be putting them 50 metres into the bushland if you haven't here, it's left under. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Can I just ask about the water? Do you have any comments on the uh, like the spacing of water? How far apart water stations must be? How far then, if you've got a dam on your property, do you need to have one nearby or further away? Any sort of thoughts on that and the actual type of location you put it in? Do you put it somewhere where, when the when it rains, there'll be water there anyway, and you can take away your water station, or are mm. you creating some sort of reliance on a permanent water supply? Uh, well, not necessarily. I mean, if water returns to the landscape, then uh, and if it's in a safe spot, then um, animals will use it. The thing with dams, they tend to be in the middle of paddocks, surrounded by open country, grassland. It's not it's not a friendly place for wildlife. Mm. They don't like crossing large open areas. Um, they feel exposed and vulnerable, and they are exposed and vulnerable. So, uh, I mean, I think these the watering stations uh, for some people. If you if you've got a bush block, you might want to just make it a permanent feature. Really think about that. And and as I said before, you know, the, the country's drying. We're, we're going to need to provide mm -hmm. these sort of things for um, for our wildlife. Like we have so altered the hydrology. This uh, country, we really need to think about getting something back. This is the thing, too. Oh, if we st do start doing this and we're encouraging then the animals to keep breeding, which may be good, may not, because it is a drought situation. Because I've heard animals kind of naturally stop breeding to suit their country. If we keep the water up and keep the food up, that means they're going to keep breeding and the country isn't going to support that at the moment because the landscape is so dry. So then we ourselves are going to have to continue to support that. Are we causing something which is, is going to... Well, yeah. There's a notion that 100% um, of a species population breeds every year. It's more like 10%, maybe 20%, and maybe 5% are successful. It's, it's an incredibly low breeding rate for most animals, like most you know, mammals at least, or vertebrates, should I say. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's quite surprising. And that's because of uh, the lack of suitable territories, um, as you say, lack of resources to actually raise a brood or, or uh, young. Mm -hmm. um, and, and animals do, they are aware of conditions, so uh, so they might not breed in particular years, or with, in the case of last year, because particularly kangaroos, they do this amazing thing where they can um, hold on to a, a fertilised cell until conditions are good, so it's called a quiescent plasticist that they can just hold that. Yeah, that's what I mean, so yeah. usually they'd hold on to that, yeah. but if we're watering and feeding them, are they going to reproduce? So we're going to cause something which we have to sustain them? Uh, well, I, I don't believe so, um, really. Uh, you know, I've yet to really see any evidence of that. And uh, uh, even by feral predators, uh, run over on the roads, um, persecuted. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, I just yeah, can't see us being overrun by native animals, and I think we're going to see a massive drop in the tourist industry because we just don't have anything <coughs> to show. Yeah, so if we decide tourists. to put out these stations, we have to commit long term. Well, I'm sort of hoping that you get some enjoyment out of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just saying, though, it's going to be a you know, thing. we need yeah. to... Yeah, sure. If we really yeah. need to think about... That's right, you do. A long-term commitment yeah. would be fantastic, yeah. particularly for the watering stations. Yeah. 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 Talking about the reproduction, I work heavily with wombats and have for a long time. In its lifetime now, it's believed a breeding female with the loss of 
baby through road kill, through uh, mange and so forth, that a female will only ever reproduce or replace herself with one viable baby in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't include the male that causes the baby. So in other words, for every breeding female, we're going backwards one. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. She'll only ever replace herself once in a lifetime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. no. so, we might leave it there for now. Yeah. I think we could probably sit here all day and keep asking <laughs> you questions. Um, we might have a really, really, really quick cup of tea.